Okay, we will kick off. I know there's still participants joining us, but I'd like to take this time just at the very start to welcome everyone and say thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Marie Morin and I'm the current director of the UCD Equality Studies Centre. And for our public seminar series, we invite leading figures in the theory and practice of equality to speak to members, colleagues and friends of the Equality Studies Centre on key inequality issues and how we might tackle them. So to this end, I'm really pleased to introduce you to Professor Andrew Sayre, who will speak to us today on the topic, Equality Flourishing and Social Change, What Now for Political Economy and Social Theory? Andrew is a longtime friend and supporter of the Equality Studies Centre and has inspired and stimulated faculty and students associated with the centre for many years now. Currently Emeritus Professor of Social Theory and Political Economy at Lancaster University, his work has drawn productively and imaginatively on the social sciences and philosophy to address questions of inequality, its causes and consequences, moral economy and ethics in everyday life. In his books, Method in Social Science and Realism and Social Science, he brought the often impenetrable paradigm of critical realism to life in an accessible, intelligible and deeply productive fashion. In The Moral Significance of Class, and why things matter to people, he has revived moral economy for contemporary audiences in a profoundly thought-provoking way, encouraging his social science readers to recover the ethical and moral aspects of their scholarship and offering a meaningful and humanistic appraisal of both the injustices of social class and the limits of social theory in addressing flourishing and suffering. In his most recent work, Why We Can't Afford the Rich, he takes on the moral and social problem of wealth inequality and translates normative critique and social scientific explanation for readers beyond the university. Andrew's patient and careful thinking, modest manner and attitude of deep care and concern for the world is evident not only in his writings, but in his engagement with others as an academic lecturer and mentor. Many here will have experienced this and I was lucky enough to find this out myself having studied under him for four months of my PhD many years ago. So thanks for speaking to us today, Andrew, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Um, before we start, Andrew's contributions have recently been recognized in the publication of Ethics, Economy and Social Science, Dialogues with Andrew Sayre, edited by Gideon Calder and Balahar Sangera, who are also joining us today. And I'm very happy to introduce you to them now because they're going to offer some responses to Andrew's talk once he's finished. Balihar Sangera, who I think you can also see, is Senior Lecturer in Sociology at the University of Kent. His research has focused on neoliberal reforms in post-Soviet Central Asia and charitable giving and philanthropy in the UK. In both areas, he uses moral economy to emphasize the ethical dimensions of economic and social life. Gideon Calder is Associate Professor of Social Philosophy and Policy at Swansea University, his research has involved the application of political and social theory to a wide range of areas, currently childhood, co-production and aspects of social welfare. So I'm going to hand over to our speakers. We'll hear first from Andrew. He will speak for 30 to 40 minutes and then this will be followed by the short responses by 10 minutes each from Gideon and Balahar. After this, I will open the floor to discussion. Uh, please write your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar. You can do this either as we go or once we come to the discussion. I believe and hope that I can unmute people uh, if you would like to ask your question in person, but be reassured your camera won't turn on or maybe not reassured, but that's the way the webinar um, works, unfortunately, but we'll, we will be able to hear your voice. So if you'd like to avail of this option, please indicate this when you're writing your question or by using the raise hand function, and I'll try to keep track of incoming questions. And finally, just to let you know, the webinar will be recorded, it's currently being recorded, and then shared on the Equality Studies Centre website afterwards. So, Andrew, I'm going to hand over to you now, just take me a minute to um, share the slides that you wanted to use, so. Right. Um, Thank you. No problem. Let me just 
Now, I hope everybody can see that. If anyone has any difficulties in the audience, you can send me a message through the chat. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Marie, and um, good evening, everyone. And um, thanks so much for this invitation. Um, I have fond memories of visiting Dublin, the UCD uh, Equality Studies, a long time ago. And um, I caught up with what you're doing on the web and looks really interesting. And um, thanks too for Ballyhar and, and Gideon in advance for responding to this. And I was asked by Marie to talk about the future of equality studies. That's lowercase equality studies, not UC in particular, in relation to social theory and political economy. And just to manage expectations, I think just looking at the website for the, for the Equality Studies Centre, so much of what I think is should be happening is already happening. So I'm not sure how much of this is going to be new or pushing at an open door. But to manage expectations, um, I'm not going to try to cover a full range of equalities. That would be far, and inequalities rather, that would be far too much. I'm going to mainly talk about economic in, in, in inequality and how it arises rather than on, on how it intersects with other axes of inequality and rather than how it impacts on people. So in relation to sources of inequality, I'm mainly talking about um, economic class and obviously the, the kind of equality which affects us all, but which is generally ignored in discussions of equal opportunities, as I'm sure you know. And I want to talk mainly about political economy, but I'm actually going to start off with a little bit about social theory and its relation to normativity, to ideas about what's good and bad. And because it seems to me social sciences relation to normativity is troubled. And also a lot of social scientists don't like to talk about flourishing and suffering. And it's become virtually obligatory for social scientists to declare them, their work critical um, and yet, many of them are reluctant to talk about well being and flourishing. And yet, it's much more common to hear terms like exploitation and oppression and abuse, um, which all imply the possibility of flourishing or suffering. They presuppose it. So, one of the interesting things about such terms is that they transcend any fact value distinction. To say some, that someone is oppressed or abused is to make something which is, make a claim which is simultaneously and indivisibly a factual claim and an evaluation. And as such, it can be more or less true or correct, and so on. And yet, often in discussions, we often hear people saying things like, of course, I have my values, but so I can't be objective, which is an absurd thing to say as if values had nothing to do with the way the world is, or what our capacities for flourishing and suffering are like, and as if valuation and objectivity could only be incompatible. And so I would say normativity is not reducible to its subjective dimension or to normalizing as it tends to be seen in post-structuralism. As the philosopher, I can have the next slide, please, I think. Um, Philippa Foote argued there on the left, at root, the meaning of good relates to life, to living beings and what allows them to flourish and do what they're capable of. And as her colleague Mary Midgley said, you can't have a plant or an animal without certain quite definite things being good or bad for it. And of course, as humans, our capacities for flourishing and suffering go much far beyond that. They're culturally elaborated in a host of diverse ways um, that extend beyond physical health and so on. And of course, we have to take these into account as well. They have an effect on well being, obviously. Anti humanists tend to respond to this diversity by adopting a relativist position as if well being or flourishing were no more than cultural inventions. And often they fall into the perfectionist trap of saying, we, because we don't know everything about well-being, and there's many things about 
which we're not sure of, which is certainly the case, we can't say anything about it. But actually we can, and I would suggest that the capabilities approach, especially as elaborated by Martha Nussbaum, does say quite a lot about what's really important and what's basic for flourishing. So an account, I would say an account of social life and especially an account of equality, which doesn't identify flourishing or suffering is deficient, not only normatively, but as a description. So that's all I want to say about social theory, if you like. I want to move on to political economy and moral economy, thanks. And uh, some basics, we should define the function of economies transhistorically, if you like, as provisioning, providing the wherewithal for societies to survive and maybe flourish. And I think we need moral economic approaches. And the kind of model I have in mind for that is perhaps different from many other people who use the term. It's very similar to classical political economy and moral philosophy in the 18th and 19th centuries, but going back all the way to Aristotle, if you like. And that kind of work not only explained how economies work, how they're structured, but evaluated them implicitly or explicit, explicitly in terms of flourishing. And originally, I, when I first started trying to push the idea of moral economy, I defined it in a rather limited fashion as studying how economics was influenced by morality and ethics and vice versa. But actually now I, th I think um, something is something far more basic and important than that which is explaining and evaluating the justifications of economic practices, their constitutive rules and norms and structures, and particularly property rights. And in, in a way, one of the things that moral philosophy has to do is to assess what, where there's um, resistance, why there's resistance, and whether that re resistance is justified. I'm saying this because I know that Balihar has picked me up on this topic before for not saying enough about resistance in the economic life. And so I'll try and remedy that. I would hope that moral economy can inform resistance and can recognize it and assess it. Um, it may, may or may not be appropriate. And it's always important to remember that a lot of resistance doesn't come from a pro from a particularly progressive dimension. It may be from those who rely upon exploitation, excluding others, and they, they resist any kind of fight back against that. And I know you in your own work, Balihar, you and, and with um, Elmira Sati Bildeva, you showed how, for example, squatters or land grabbers um, in Kyrgyzstan have invoked moral economic concepts of economic justice and so on. And yes, that happens a lot. I think they're implicit in some of the discourse of um, strikers in the UK at the moment. Um, so I hope that, you know, would hope that moral economy can inform resistance, but resistance of, of a progressive kind, not one which reinforces suffering. Because, you know, when CEOs making windfall gains um, resist, pressure to forego their gains and so on. That's not a good form of resistance when we tend to forget that, that problem, that kind of uh, resistance, but it's extremely important. The UK government is resisting strike, strike action at the moment. Okay. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Now, when we consider equality, it's tempting to turn to political theory. And if, I find that very frustrating often. It's very intelligent and clever. From the outside, it seems to be dominated by so-called ideal theory, particularly that of Rawls. And it seems remote from the main concerns we have about economic justice. It can seem like a way of not talking about these problems that we face. And sometimes at worst, just a vehicle for demonstrating cleverness. Um, so, for example, if you take the capabilities approach, 
um, which is a way of answering the question, equality of what? Good way, I think. But often it's discussed just at the level of desirable components of flourishing, the capable, what are the capabilities in abstraction from economic and other social relations, which might impact upon whether people have those capabilities or not. And treated in abstraction from all that, capabilities approach and other approaches like normative approaches like that threaten nothing, which is why they're to be a little bit cynical, they're so popular. So they do deserve to be popular. And we so we need to couple can, capabilities analysis, needs-based analysis theories with analyses of actual economic and, and other social relations. And as Elizabeth Anderson has argued, equality isn't just a matter of differences in outcomes or opportunities, but a matter of social relations. And that's most obvious in the case of gender, race. It's also class as well. And in, in economic matters, it's the same. One can imagine a situation where you've got a group like a team, a work team, where they all get the same pay, but maybe a few for no good reason, take it easy and free ride on the labor of others. Now they all get the same pay. That doesn't mean to say it's, it's equal and it's all um, you know, a just situation. The free rider's income would be largely unearned and at the expense of others, unnecessary expense, shall we say. So we need to consider not only um, distributive justice, but contributive justice. The first part of the famous slogan, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Economies don't work without contribution to production. They need work. So we need to look at relations and these include capitalists and workers, buyer and buyers and sellers, creditors and debtors, a whole host of them. And if you th think about them, most of them are unequal and some unequal in problematic ways. Okay, so we can't understand economic justice without going into these component relations, in addition to the net effect of them. Um, okay. It's, and unless we go into these social relations, it will appear that we've got winners and losers, but in a game which seems to be fair. Um, and maybe the losers need a bit of help to be more successful in that game, not addressing whether the game is rigged or whether it's fair. And Elizabeth Anderson gave a nice e example of someone watching a, a game of musical chairs and deciding that the people left standing at the end of the game need to try harder or need help with their, their performance, as if the structure of the game had nothing to do, it, to do with it. Well, the structure of the game is, of course, fundamental. And so much social, so much literature on economic justice, distributive justice, ignores these social relations and these structures, and property relations in particular, and implicitly obscures and naturali naturalizes them, as if to say, nothing to see here, move along. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is the top 1% of fiscal income share, taxable income share in Ireland from 1938 till 2016. And like a lot of countries, it fell dramatically um, in the uh, 20th, early 20th century until the 1970s, and then rose again. And similarly in Britain, um, the wealth of the top 1% um, fell dramatically in the beginning of the 20th century to a low of about 6% of total income in the 1970s, and now is about 12, 13%. So the, the rich have come back. And we, we're faced with what Peter Townsend, the sociologist of inequality, called the problem of riches. And so much social research, as we know, in, on inequality is about the poor, the disadvantaged. And that's totally understandable um, but it's 
it's that's a non-relational approach and it's you know, not always often the cultural tensions between different classes and so on are brought out that we need to look at the rich who are generally neglected otherwise that you know the critique of the rich is just about things like um, greed and and corruption not the structures which enable them to be rich okay um and as i argued in why we can't afford the rich the problem of riches arises because the rich depend largely on unearned income can i have the next slide please if you go on amazon and put the words passive income into the book search you come up with loads of books about passive income and in effect they're all get rich quick books and mostly american but not all of the one on the right is british i think and um the passive income is a euphemism for un unearned income income you can get from controlling assets without providing any new um, labor services or goods in return you control something that other people need they have to pay you for it you don't have to work how to give up your day job and put your feet up well that's really crucial and the next slide please marie um back in january there was a big row about the ch the former chancellor nadine zahawi's taxes chancellor of the exchequer exchequer as such he was in charge of taxation in britain and yet at that very time he was in dispute with the um HMRC, the tax body in Britain, about unpaid taxes, and he was having to pay a seven-figure fine, um, ta taxation on undeclared millions. And uh, during that very period, um, the Daily Mail put this headline out and on its front page, which uses this phrase, something for nothing, which is always used against the poor. And so there's a very common trick. They, they um, forget that income tax is only about 40% of total tax receipts of the government. And yes, um, the top 10% of earners do account for 53% of all income tax, I'd say so they should, but the bottom 10% pay more of their income out in tax than any other part of the population. The bottom 10 percent and they're paying vat they're paying national insurance they're paying all sorts of other taxes and um so no wonder it looks like they get more benefits than they pay in tax and so on it's completely misleading but this kind of discourse sometimes goes down very well with those people who are being targeted and um, Tracy Childrick and Robert McDonald did research on people on very low incomes and how they see the situation. And very often, even though in many cases they're on benefits themselves, they blame others for being scrounged, basically. And they internalize this, which is quite alarming, but that fits with the common finding that the, most une the more une unequal a country, the less people are concerned about inequality. Next slide, please. So sociology in particular has often ignored the rich or limited itself to studying their social networks and geographical mobility, which of course are important and have effects, but the source of their income is generally um, not, not scrutinized. And I, actually I know Marie has been writing on financial elites, but I think that's still unusual. And there's, um, I would recommend this book called The Code of Capital by Katharina Pistor, which came out, came out um, a couple of years ago, three years ago. And as the subtitle says, it shows how law has enabled the rich to not only be, get a lot of income, how to avoid tax and how to protect it, their wealth from any creditors, if, if any, part of their business goes bankrupt, um, then the rest of their assets are, are protected by um, credible um, Byzantine 
um, web of laws, which increasingly, although they've been be, being developed over centuries, increasingly they've been developed by corporate lawyers, not by governments, just been rubber stamped by governments. And it's a very well written book, but it's tough going because it's so technical and it's an alien world. The whole world of finance, so social scientists often comment on how the rich are separated from the rest. They don't need the state very much. They don't come into contact with the rest of the population. They're in their own separate world, but they rely upon another alien world, which is that of finance. And what I call the golden rule, as we all know, those with the gold make the rules. In the UK, actually, um, quite a, a significant minority of land is uh, under ownership, which whether well, we don't know who the owner is, because the owners don't have to declare their ownership and, unless they sell their land. So if they don't sell the land, it needn't appear in the public register. And just over 20,000 people own half the land in Britain, which is an astonishing figure. So can we move on next, please? Slide, next slide. Now a really simple distinction for cutting through some of the, the thickets of um, detail is an old one made up over a hundred years ago by three different um, sort of moral economists and L.T. Hobhouse called it the, the difference between property for use and property for power. Hobson called it property versus improperty. Tawney called it property for, with function and property without function. And property for use is everything we need to have and to use to enable us individually or as households to live and work to provide for ourselves. That's very necessary. But property for power or improperty goes beyond this, involving controlling assets that others need but lack, such as land or money or means of production or access to key digital platforms in order to extract economic rent. And those who rely significantly on this improperty we call rentiers. And I think we need to try and get terms like rentier and unearned income into, into public discourse. Although that will be difficult. One of the reasons why it would be difficult is that it could meet some resistance from part of the middle classes, those who have been kind of incorporated into a rentier regime on a small scale in, so that by owning their own house or maybe several properties buy to let and also through private pensions invested in wealth extraction via shares and bonds and other financial instruments that makes them small time rentiers and people rely upon for their retirement in some cases upon these sources of unearned income so they're small time rentiers so strategically in order to reduce the dead weight of unending um, and the injustice of it um, will be probably a slow process um, because we don't want to crash the housing market and put loads of people in massive um, negative equity. Anyway, moving on please. Moving on to address the elephant in the room the global climate and ecological crisis. Um, we're ultimately dependent on, dependent on the biosphere for everything, our metabolism with nature. There's no chance of our future being secured to so-called green growth. That's a fantasy. Decarbonization for each product is proceeding, but at a much slower rate than the growth of sheer volume of stuff. And there's, so there's no chance, as this diagram suggests, of um, stopping runaway um, climate and global heating without limiting the consumption of the richest 10% of the world's population who are responsible for nearly 50% of household CO2 emissions. Everyday living and consumption and the emissions it creates. 
So for rich countries, post-growth is imperative. And in political theory recently, there's been developing a, a so-called advocacy of limitarianism, people like Ingrid Robins, where person, arguing that personal wealth, personal income should be capped at a maximum level. Well, I agree, but that's not sufficient because you still have to tackle the social relations of its under which it arises, how wealth is obtained, and so on. And financialization is particularly toxic here because it's in creating mountains of debt, it's predicated on future growth to enable that debt to be paid off. So it's very difficult for politicians to resist the call to say we're going for growth. Moving on, next slide, please. And um, I think in this situation, we have to go back to basics and ask ourselves, what is wealth? And we sometimes use that word in a very broad way. It's one, one that goes beyond the economic to, to refer to an abundance of things which enable us to flourish, things which we love and so on. When we narrow down and focus on economic wealth, we need to remember that economics is about provisioning. It's about use values, whether they're commodified or not. And economic wealth is ultimately goods and services, including labor services like care work and teaching. Economic value is use values. In practice though, when we use the word wealth, we immediately tend to think of money. But actually that's problematic, misleading because it's not only that it limits thinking about the economy to the, the, the cash economy, ignoring an unpaid part of the economy. It's also that um, money itself has no value. What it is, is a means of getting use values, which do constitute wealth, where they are commodified, where they're for sale. It's a means of getting that part of economic wealth, which is commodified. That's what money is. So it's a prime means of access to use value and therefore is hugely important. So that the limits to provisioning are ultimately to do with material and human resources, including labor, not money. Firms and individuals don't create money, governments and banks do. And once we confuse money with wealth, wealth with money, then we are likely to make further mistakes like imagining that only the private sector creates wealth, because much of the public sector provides things um, free at the point of use. So it doesn't make money. So does that mean it's not a wealth creator? Well, of course it is. So health services, which are those which are delivered free, are our, amongst our most important forms of wealth. They provide us with fundamental use values. Your health is your wealth. Makes a lot of sense. And what about wealth creation? Who are the wealth creators? Well, they include people like teachers and care assistants. They're wealth creators without doubt. And if we can change the, begin to change the public discourse on that, it's, that would be a great step forward. So misunderstanding the relationship between money and wealth is endemic in our society and I, actually I think it helps to go back to Aristotle to appreciate this and he talked about the running of largely self-sufficient households of his time the goal of economic activity there would be providing use values needed to support their way of life and insofar as money was used it was a, a way to get those few use values which were for sale and he regarded those who saw it the other way around, not as money as a means to get some use value, but saw money as a way of getting more money as perverted, you know, this was a pathology, it was a perversion, an aberration. Of course, under capitalism, for capitalists, this aberration is an, is a, an imperative. And for the rest of us, where well, we certainly need money to get most of our use values, but we've been encouraged more and more to use money to, to get more money, um, 
particularly by treating our houses as, as assets and so on. And we're encouraged, of course, through advertising to indulge in what Aristotle called pleonaxia, insatiable acquisitiveness. More and more stuff. And of course, for the planet, that's disastrous. And if we imagine a, a kind of modern equivalent of a largely self-sufficient household, so producing most of what it needs, um, it would be clear to the members of the household to what extent the social relations were, were fair on the whole or unfair. And it would also be clear what the, the environmental costs were. But as soon as you have markets and geographically extended divisions of labor across the world, and trade, then those, many of those social and environmental costs get hidden. Space hides things from us. And both for this reason and because of its property relations, capitalism is a system of unpaid costs, unpaid social costs, and unpaid environmental costs, as the economist K.W. Capp said. So we have to ask the question, what is enough? Or perhaps what is too much? Which of course is difficult. And here, I think we can make a link between responding to global heating, ecological disruption and social justice. Too much um, in terms of levels and types of consumption that, and, and also ownership that deprives of others, others of meeting needs is bad on both environmental grounds and on uh, just economic justice grounds. So, and next slide, please. Sorry, yeah. and the next one. That's it. So how do we unite those whose main worry is the end of the month and those whose main worry is the end of the planet, as it was so brilliantly put during the Gilets Jaunes protests in France, which is politically a very mixed bunch of people. Well, those whose negative impact on the climate is the greatest, the well-off and the rich must pay the most, obviously. And I agree that in addressing global heating and such like, this will depend upon social justice. And that, that's not just a matter of wishful thinking, you know, trying to piggyback one kind of good thing on, the, on another good thing. Rather, it's politi politically, it's a condition of its possibility. So um, some forms of redistribution may be actually bad for the environment, some forms of climate taxes and such like may be, sorry, some forms of redistribution, yeah, may be bad for the climate and some forms of um, taxation of carbon and so on could impact more on the poor than, than the rich. So they don't necessarily go together. It depends upon how it's done. And most generally, the poor have a much um, greater propensity to, to consume, to spend their money, their in what income they get, than the rich do. So redistribution is likely to push up levels of consumption of stuff. So you know, this isn't an easy combination. Okay, um, getting near the end now. Next slide, please. There are lots of ways forward and there's no way I can address anything like a full range, but one component which I think is deserves more attention is the foundational economy concept and the movement in, in Britain and in many countries. One, it's one of the things we need for a post-growth economy. And this covers basic use values necessary for daily life for ordinary people. The daily essential goods and services like health, education, care, food, housing, utilities like energy, water and broadband, the infrastructure of daily life. These are preconditions for well-being. And th th this movement is informed by the capabilities approach, informed by donut economics, and it prioritizes well-being rather than economic growth. And it seeks social justice within planetary limits. And it, sim it doesn't simply call for re-establishment of the old relationships between state market and civil society that were current in the high period of the welfare state, which often 
created problems of control and, and lack of democratic involvement, actually. But to get away from that, we need more involvement of local governments and, and of the public. And particularly interesting here is the idea of social licensing. Traditional welfare state models um, a provision often left users with little power, replacing support with discipline and offering them neither voice nor exit. But social licensing, as they call it, would make the right to trade locally dependent on providing a service plus meeting negotiated criteria of the community, like payment of living wages, protection of the environment, providing of training and so on. And the hope is that this will also help to recruit popular support for such a, um, a line of development. Okay. So it's something which can contribute to answering the question of what kind of economy and way of life is fair, sustainable, and supports well-being. But it needs to be coupled with strategies which reduce the power of asset owners to extract unearned income and to require economic growth which support financialization. So um, concluding this, I guess many of you will have seen this brilliant diagram from Kate Raworth, Donut Economics, and the outer circle is the outer limits beyond which we are overshooting the, the, planetary, the planet's um, capacity for sustainable um, continuation. And the inner limits um, are where it become where people can't survive and flourish. So we have to find a way of living in that space in between. And basically, um, I hope that this what I've been talking about um, in terms of moral economy and non-ideal theory and the problem of riches, rethinking wealth, um, is a contribution to reaching this safe and just space. So there's many other things, um, but I'll hand over to others to take take up that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Andrew. That was a really fascinating talk, and you touched on such a wide variety of things that matter so much. I always think when I'm listening to you, oh, this is what really matters. And uh, I, I had that feeling the whole way through your talk again. So another weird element of the Zoom world is that you can't hear people clapping and uh, you know, appreciating your talk. But I can tell you that there wasn't one participant who dropped out for the whole of your talk, which is in itself very unusual in the world of Zoom. So it stayed steady the whole way through, Andrew. So thank you so much. And um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. But before we go to the floor, I'll go to our two uh, respondents. And first up, I believe, is Gideon. And I'll just stop sharing um, Andrew's slides and hand over to you, Gideon, if that's OK. Thank you, Marie, and thank you, Andrew. I just wanted to start by saying what a privilege it was to be involved in the putting together of that book with Balihar about Andrew's work, but also how completely exhausting it is keeping up with all the things that Andrew talks about. Um, and I'm not going to try to um, do justice to the sheer range of things that uh, Andrew's just put on the table. I'm sure other people will want to pick up on some of the threads which have emerged there. Um, but instead, I just want to say a little bit about why a uh, post-disciplinary approach to inequality and social justice is such a valuable thing to do. And I think that's maybe, as Andrew said at the start, that might not be news to people at the Equalities, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the Equality Studies Centre at UCD. And it certainly won't be news to people who are fans of Andrew's general approach to things, but it's a really underheard point, I think, still in the academy. And I think that's odd, and I want to say a little bit about why that is, but I think I might start with an anecdote which um, helps convey why doing this post-disciplinary stuff can be quite a risky business. I was at the launch, it must be nearly 10 years ago, of why we can't afford the rich in London. And I was just sitting there as an audience member and uh, various people were speaking, Andrew was speaking, Anne Pettifor, The Economist was speaking, Polly Toynbee from The Guardian. And um, just along for me was a guy 
who was getting really fidgety and huffy and puffy all the way through. And after a while, I was trying to catch what he was muttering under his breath. And he was he kept saying things like, God, this guy hasn't even read, hasn't even completed Economics 101. And um, in the end, he, I don't know if you remember this, Andrew, but he, he stood up and asked a very prolix question about something or other. And both the question and the mutterings under his breath were completely proving the point that you were making about the limitations of Economics 101. And the fact that he couldn't see that and went away very cross at the fact that you hadn't um, seen eye to eye with him on that. Just it sat with me for a long time afterwards. So I thought, blimey, how do you have a have a discussion about economics when people operate within those very tightly controlled boundaries and often just completely miss the point of what is being said from a different kind of perspective? And it seems like you might annoy almost everybody working in a post-disciplinary way. Um, but the flip side of that is that I think your work, Andrew, has, made, has been really instrumental in making that a safer way to work and probably a more credible approach to take among kind of a wider audience in the academy. Um, and I just think I, I think that whole way of working is, is really crucial to how we understand and tackle social injustice. So the dimensions of inequality, for example, what it's like and how it happens and what effects it has, why it matters, none of those could conceivably be owned by a single discipline. And our understanding of them is really ill-served by any assumption that they they might be. Um, so while work in any field might be done better or worse or might be illuminating or shoddy in terms of what it contributes to our understanding of some, something like inequality. Uh, disciplinary chauvinism is never a good way in which to weigh its merits. So the fact that somebody's not talking the right way about something is never going to be a very good basis on which to dismiss their work. Um, I want to say a little bit about my own kind of, there's a kind of meta-theoretical position that I that I come from in all this. And it's that um, description is basically the motor of the kind of normative political theorizing that we tend to turn to when we're looking for reasons why inequality is bad. So I say a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, at a really early stage, the kind of the theoretical work which helps us analyze uh, and find normative responses to inequality is about devising kind of co coherent descriptions and comparisons which show what injustice looks like. And the important, maybe that sounds obvious, I don't know, but uh, my original kind of training was in political philosophy and there you find very often the reverse kind of assumption. So you find the assumption that descriptions of the world are there to help us refine our accounts of principles and finesse how we might properly apply them. That's a very common set of assumptions. So the, the political philosophy seminar room is a slightly odd place. It works as if we conceptualize injustice and then notice examples of it in the world. And I think that that is pretty much the reverse of how things go in practice and also how they theoretically necessarily go. As my colleague at Swansea, Patrick Coburn has put it, no one ever saw injustice by seeing that a principle had been violated. That's not the way in which we experience anger about the way the world is. That's it, it, the reverse tends to have been true. And what will show us that a principle has been violated is TV footage or a diary or a journalistic account or a photo or the story of an event that marks it out for us as a cause for concern. And that sort of kind of, the, Andrew refers often to the scholastic fallacy, the, the assumption that it's somehow the world uh, conforms to the seminar room or that if we start in the seminar room and we'll get a good grip on the way the world is, is borne out by a lot of theory about 
social justice. And I just think that's really unfortunate. It takes you a long time to get your head around that if you're studying that kind of thing in, a in the world of political theory. And what you're getting your head around is that, is that assumption that you could start there from principles and then just find descriptions which somehow lent themselves to fleshing out what those principles meant. So Andrew's statement when he was talking earlier on uh, that an account of life which doesn't identify flourishing or suffering is deficient, not only normatively, but as a description seems exactly right to me. And his next point that he made just after that, that to describe social life, we need thick ethical concepts also seems very helpful to me, but I would argue something else, which he didn't quite say, which I would really stress a great deal, which is that we need to situate the ethical very carefully here. So flourishing and suffering are not ethical concepts that themselves swing free of the description at stake. So we partly unpack what it is to flourish or to suffer through that descriptive mode of just saying what we see or trying to show what the world is like. So there's a state of mutual dependence between the descriptive and the normative. And there's something very important about holding them quite close uh, so that they might interact fruitfully when we're going about our work. And that means it's really bad when political theorists just do everything on the kind of conceptual plane with a kind of jousting and a, a sort of version of being clever, which consists in thinking up neat thought experiments or counter examples and just kind of bringing the world in every now and then to prove a point or whatever. But there's also a real problem when sociologists, and this is something Andrew was just talking about, I'm just plagiarizing him here really, but when sociologists talk as if the wrongness of something like, for example, class barriers in education or other kinds of inequality are somehow self-evident or capturable just by referring to social justice, as if there's a kind of obviousness about why it is that things like that are wrong. And there's also, this is something I, I wrote a bit about a couple of years ago, there's also something problematic in the world of social policy where people often do something quite similar. They assume that uh, there is a thing called social justice and that the analysis of this or that policy and its implications can be kind of fitted into that framework. And the response that the solution of whatever the problem is, is often very kind of simplistic, sometimes very monistic. It assumes that a single set of values can somehow sort out the, the problem. The, 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 and that, I think, is limiting and problematic. But that's not to downplay the significance of that kind of work. I think that, you know, everything social policy does is vital uh, to our understanding of inequality. And likewise, when I say social policy, I mean the people working in that discipline. And likewise, sociology is crucial, um, just as much as political theory is, in terms of unpacking what things like social injustice actually mean. And uh, I've got a chapter in the book myself, which is about some of this stuff. Um, and it concludes by saying that, um, basically, I think every, every political theorist, everybody who purports to be talking about the nature of social justice at the theoretical level, anybody who's bothered about equality in that kind of way should read The Moral Significance of Class. I'm a particular fan of that book of Andrews because it was in reading it that um, this importance of post-disciplinarity first really sank in with me because it shows, as well as any book I know, how to move between the descriptive, the explanatory, and the normative registers in a way which adds up to a really coherent and compelling story of why inequality is, at the lay level, as well as in grander terms, just a bad thing. And all of his just, work- tends Just to have, a minute or two left, Gideon. Yeah, I'm nearly there. All of his work tends to have those qualities. Um, much of my own current work, focus on the relationship between the ordinary or the everyday experiences of life and practices and wider questions about the explanation and negotiation of social justice. And um, Andrew's work has just helped for me and for lots of others redefine and sharpen how those relations are seen 
And it's one of those things that once you've seen things in that kind of way and felt that you have the permission to work along those lines, you can't unsee it. You can't un undo those kinds of habits of working. And I think they're such effective and helpful tools that Andrew's given us. Um, just to add a note at the end, and what I've heard tonight, I think Andrew actually is a limitarian in spirit. I think he sounded quite sceptical there about how far limitarianism can take us, but I think that's right. I think you need to be sceptical because I think it needs to be supplemented with an idea of what uh, equality looks like. So the idea that Nobody should have resources beyond a certain upper threshold, like money, land, greenhouse gas emissions, however you're talking, it seems highly important, but equally important is that we should keep equality at the heart of what we, of how we kind of flesh that out and what it might mean in practice. And that's just another reason to uh, commend Andrew's work to those who've yet to read it and to encourage those who have read a bit to read more, because I think it's always a very helpful place to go. I'll hand over to Baliha. Thank you so much, Gideon, for that very thoughtful reflection. Um, Baliha, go straight to you now, uh, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, uh, Maria. Um, um, just to say thanks, Maria, to Ruben and the colleagues at the uh, UCD for this invitation and for hosting this, uh, this event. Um, I really do kind of uh, appreciate this. Um, uh, like Gideon, it was an honour uh, to be part of the uh, book project. It was a highly enjoyable experience. It, it was a labour of love. Uh, you know, I didn't have to worry about rep or anything like that. It was something that I gladly did uh, because, you know, it was just worth doing. And, uh, and, and thank you for Andrew for agreeing to, to our suggestion to, to, to have this book. And uh, also, I should say, all the contributors were also fully enthused when they were invited to contribute, uh, they they just gladly did it. So so again, thank you, Andrew, for giving this for giving us the opportunity. Um, like many, uh, I have found Andrew's work invaluable in shaping my research. Uh, I've gained immensely from his insight on the nature of political economy and his thought-provoking remarks about ethics and social theory. Um, let me identify uh, uh, two areas of his talk that he gave today that stand out for me, and I suspect stand out for others in the audience. Um, firstly, the issue of uh, unearned income and rontism. Uh, Andrew has helped to make a compelling case uh, uh, for the distinction uh, between earned and unearned income. His book, Why We Can't Afford the Rich, uh, has been significant in bringing this issue to, to the public attention, and he should be credited for leading the charge. Thank you, Andrew. And second, uh, his perspective on moral economy has been invaluable. Um, I mean, I found it that were critically insightful uh, in many ways. Um, he focuses on why we should care about economic relations and institutions. Ultimately, they matter because they affect our well-being and the, the future of humanity. Um, the, the rest of the, my talk, I really want to talk about Rontism at the uh, global stage. I know Andrew has uh, focused uh, uh, much of his talk around Rontier class. I just want to kind of tease out what is the value of discussing Rontier state, uh, if there is a value. Um, of, of, of undertaking such, a, such an exercise. And in doing so, I should, I should say, my thoughts are rather speculative and apologies in, in, in advance or uh, in, in, in trying to kind of flesh out why I think discussing one case state could be a valuable part of the overall discussion around Rontism, as well as talking about the Rontier class. Often the term Ronte state uh, refers to resource rich countries like Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, um, Kuwait, uh, other, and, 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 and others that have you know, rich uh, uh, minerals and, uh, 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 and oil and gas. Um, this had the effect of making these countries guilty of Ronteism as if 
and everything that goes with it, uh, corruption, authoritarianism. And it then lets off other countries who are not involved uh, with, with Rontism, uh, from free from blame of, of corruption and, and lack of democracy that occur in these countries. So it's often seen that political turmoil is an internal matter to these regimes, nothing to do with the global north. It's all the problem with the global south. But I don't think this is quite right. Um, Lenin uh, noted that uh, that it was the uh, that European imperial countries that were frontier states, because they had indebted overseas countries and colonies. Um, the European countries were parasitic on other countries, transferring immense wealth into their urban 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 places and building mansions and. Uh, and often sometimes uh, uh, propping up their industries at the expense of decimating other industries in the South. And of course, uh, the Navy and the Army played their part as day leaves uh, to ensure payments if required. Um, value extraction sometimes occurred through chartered monopolies like the East Indian Company, which had pillaged uh, 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 plundered and raped India for over two centuries with the blessing of the British government. Shari Soro, uh, in his uh, book, The Inglorious Empire, chronicles the nature and extent of looting in India. And this was all justified as civilizing mission by the, by, by the white population. Um, uh, um, and, 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 and bringing the barbarians to a proper rule of law. Um, and it is also interesting to note, uh, as, as uh, uh, Thoreau points out, that at the start of the British Raj, India had a thriving industry, especially the textile industry. But this got uh, dismantled over time, um, and uh, so that the uh, industries in, in, in uh, England, in Britain and England, in Britain and Scotland could flourish. So much was taken and plundered from India that India was left devastated and reduced to starvation. Thoreau makes the interesting comment that India was the first deindustrialized country in the world. Um, and of course, the East Indian Company used uh, uh, um, violence force to suppress insurrection and rebellion um, in order also to ensure, of course, that it was able to secure rent extraction from, from, from India. I suppose coming to contemporary times, um, I, would, I would argue that the uh, uh, United States and uh, European countries continue to be frontier states. Uh, capital is challenged, is, is, is challenged, is challenged uh, um, into real estate, bank accounts, stock markets, and football teams in Europe. Um, these countries offer incentives to corrupt officials uh, to, to cheat and steal from their population, leaving their population starving and impoverished, whilst their bank accounts and uh, 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 and, and, their, and, their, and their entourage live extremely well. So uh, the tax havens in the North have facilitated, I would argue, corruption and violence in the global South. Arguably, uprising and rebellions such as the Arab uprising, the color revolution in the post-service space, coups in Africa, uh, can be partly linked to wealth extraction by corrupt politicians. And to uh, some extent, global rentism has been responsible for this political instability uh, in, in, in these regions. Um, of course, coming to some of the um, more recent political turmoils and geopolitical conflicts, it is, I think it's interesting, it's in our colleagues, that we see natural resources as, uh, um, as, as, as 
partly been responsible for conflicts. One can think about Iraq uh, and, 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 uh, and, and Libya, of course, but I would also suggest Ukraine. It is interesting, is it not, that the uh, United States was strongly opposed to the gas pipe between Germany and Russia. And it is reported that uh, it was the US that blew the Nord Stream pipeline. What's the aim to make Europe dependent on the United States uh, uh, liquefied petroleum gas? Does the conflict uh, ensure that the uh, military industrial complex in the United States benefit from contracts that there will then uh, uh, be uh, uh, and, and, and thereby being able to uh, uh, profit from this kind of war profiting that usually takes place. Just a, just a minute or two. Minutes. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, furthermore, I think the US ability to act as a rentier state is facilitated by the dollar being a hegemonic currency, allowing the government to spend on military, uh, on, on, on military armaments uh, without making cuts elsewhere. And for the uh, United States banks, for American banks to acquire assets abroad by just creating money, effectively getting something for nothing. So, uh, and this system, this, this system has been facilitated by international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. So, and, 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 and I will end with this. So, I think it's right that, as Andrew points out, Rontism is a threat to humanity, partly because of the uh, ecological crisis that he, uh, that he ended on. But I think it's also worth bearing in mind that Rontism can also result in military conflict, uh, as we are witnessing now. And, and this should be a matter of concern for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pelihar. Thank you both for very thoughtful reflections. And people who are interested can have a look at their book, which is subtitled Dialogues with Andrew Sayre. Um, Andrew, you probably want to respond to both, but I'm going to go first to the floor, if that's OK, to give some people a chance to come into the discussion because we are ending at half seven. So, um, John, some people have been writing their questions in. I'm not sure if everybody can see them. John, Barry, um, I've just allowed you to talk because I know you specified you'd like to ask your question in person. You may regret that, given me. You know, I'll Good. keep you <laughs> to the time limit as well. Keep you right. Good evening, everybody. Um, greetings from Belfast. Thank you, Andrew, for that wonderful presentation. I've just had two hours of a very torrid University College Union meeting from four till six. So your dulcet tones and uh, intellectual stimulation was a balm to the soul and the, uh, and the brain. Uh, just before I ask the question, I wanted to ask Andrew, just a comment on what uh, has just been said there in terms of the connection between imperialism, colonialism, and I think particular economic growth. And there's an Irish dimension to this, that just as Marx said, capitalism goes into the world dripping from every pore with blood. It's the same with our modern conception of economic growth. It actually has its origins. And this is from orthodox uh, economic historians in the Cromwellian period in colonized Ireland in the 17th century with a, a, a guy called Sir William Petty. And of course, the point being that the concept of economic growth and it's fascinating and gratifying for someone who's been uh, often as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit for promoting a post-growth perspective for the past three decades to, uh, to read uh, a fellow ally now in, in Andrew, is that the point being that uh, economic growth itself began as an extractivist uh, concept. It wasn't, it was about completely about um, looking at uh, exchange and not use value. But that's more by way of segue, and that, that's the danger, Marie, of, of me speaking rather than just reading out my question. The question I have to, to Andrew has more to do with the types of policies that might go along with an egalitarian post-growth uh, political economy reorganization, and particularly in terms of your views on policies such as universal basic services, um, or what I would call more generally the, the necessity to socialize consumption. Uh, for ecological and egalitarian reasons, we absolutely have to move away from the privatized, commoditized, 
individual consumption patterns that we've experienced, particularly in the last 30 years. So that's one question, this issue of, you know, your views on universal basic services. I'm not particularly a fan of universal basic income, I have to say, particularly when tech millionaires like Elon Musk are promoting them. But then on the other side, um, what I would call the democratization of production in that the more we extend processes of democratic decision making within the sphere of production, empirically we tend to find this acts as a way of slowing down efficiency, slowing down the uh, you know productivism, which is part of this growth unsustainable dynamic. So there's the two questions, the socialization of consumption, particularly through universal basic services, and your views then on the democratization of production, particularly through uh, workplace democracy. But once again, I sincerely mean that, Andrew, that's been an absolute balm to my soul today. Thank you. Andrew, I'll let you respond now because you've had three sets of things, but I do have at least three questions that I have to read out from the floor. So, but over yeah. to you first. Um, universal basic services, um, yeah, very much in favor and uh, see them as wholly compatible with foundational economy, perhaps foundational economy is a bit broader in scope, includes other things as well. Um, yeah, privatization of services is, is, can be dangerous, as we see in the case of um, billionaires controlling access to private, to, to social media. It's very, extremely dangerous. Uh, democratization of the economy. Well, yeah, I've, I've argued before that and it, it's actually compatible with using markets, you know, worker-owned cooperatives, and other not-for-profit kind of organizations supplying to markets. Markets are actually quite a good way of coordinating a lot of things if they're regulated properly. Um, but so there's two very brief answers to that. Come on to Gideon. This post-disciplinary business, I just wanted to say that um, We must remember that early social science was pre-disciplinary. You know, my model of um, pre-disciplinary is Adam Smith. You know, and within within, a, within a, a page, he moves from psychology to what is now sociology to what is um, economics and politics. You know, and that makes him so much more interesting than you know contemporary um, economists. I mean, it, economics is in a, in a dire state. It doesn't realize it failed to couldn't even predict the last the 2008 crisis. Um, it's governed in academia by a monopoly. The heterodox economists are excluded largely and squeezed out to the margins. And they still have the, um, the ear of the, the media. Regarding political theories and principles um, that Gideon raised, this point that Gideon raised, I think it's really important. And uh, coincidentally, I'm a fan of Elizabeth Anderson, and I was listening on a YouTube to her lecture called Can We Talk? And it's basically about how you talk across the political divide in a meaningful way. So it's not just a, like a boxing match going for the knockout punch. And um, particularly in light of the culture wars. And she emphasizes that the educated left, part of the left, tends to lead with principles. And that just doesn't work. And it, what they need to do is listen to the other side and to their descriptions of their lives and the particular events, anecdotes even, that led them to a certain way of looking at the world. And that fits entirely with Ali, Rosh, Ali Hochschild's book, um, Strangers in Their Own Land, which is about members of the Tea Party in Louisiana where she did an ethnography and befriended these right-wing people who are demonized by the left and tried to understand where they're coming from, why they um, hated environmentalists, even though they lived in the most polluted part of the USA and all that, by listening to their descriptions, which, as Gideon says, of their lives. And moving on to Balihar, yes, restore rent rentier states, really important. And not only with the resource curse, or as in Britain, the finance curse that we have, which distorts the whole economy. Yes, the history is of capitalism is also a history of rentierism. And yeah, I, I would recommend the Thoreau book, book on India that is Inglorious Empire, a terrific book, 
really eye-opening for, um, for a lot of people, I think. And is that, but I think um, actually radical political economy, including Marxism, has been complicit in this underestimation on uh, the importance of rentierism because it's primarily interested in what are the necessary conditions for capitalism, what's distinctive about capitalism. And so you have the classic productive capitalists, not the rentier capitalists. They're only dealt with in volume three, you know, it's, 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 and a tidying up operation, it seems like. And Marx thought they would become subordinate to productive capital. Well, the opposite has happened in many countries. So, okay, it isn't um, essential to capitalism. In many ways, it's a burden for productive capitalism. It obstructs it, but it's a great way of making money. It's an easier way of making money. And from the very start, as Balihar said, it's been important. And so, yeah, I think. Ironically, radical political economy has been has uh, failed to notice that. So. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to read three questions that have come in. I'm sorry if people can or can't see the questions. I think when I reply to someone, it might disappear. So, um, but these people have asked that I read out their questions. So, firstly, um, I'm assuming Ku. Thank you for this wide ranging and very comprehensible talk. I'd like to ask what equality theorizing thinking ought to do about the burden of injustice originating in historical dispossession and extraction, and whether it is relevant or important to address what I see as an increasing sense of rage by the especially racialized dispossessed. So that I think connects into some of the points Balihar raised. Uh, then from John Parker, the question, does the concept and process of relative deprivation have significant implications for an economics of enough because of the way emotional responses are provoked by experiences of inequality? Thank you for that, John. And then Alan Green has asked, uh, we hear a lot about low growth in UK recently. How do you see the growing role of rentierism, tying up cash and increasing wealth extraction as impacting upon growth? So um, over to you, Andrew. I think maybe you can see the questions as well. Um, so the first one about historical injustices. Well, first of all, they have to be acknowledged. This is part of the truth about what happened. We need to know the truth. And we need to acknowledge the harm that it's caused. And you know, this question of whether we apologize or can we apologize on behalf of our ancestors well um yes i guess it is important to do so and to actually try to refine ways of um whether it's in the form of reparations or in the terms of in, in the form of helping development in a way which primarily benefits the recipients rather than um, the rich countries so not creating not uh, just lending money, but interest and so on. So yes, those injustices do need to be acknowledged. Um, I was brought up in a culture which totally ignored them, denied them. Valerie Ha said we were a civilizing force and uh, you know, a benefactor and all that kind of nonsense. Um, so yeah, education in the... Uh, imperial countries needs to, to deal with that as well. Um, relative deprivation and the economics of enough. Um, one of the problems of a, an economy of more and more is um, planned obsolescence. So one of the reasons why, um, I think, well, I think the concept of relative deprivation is a perfectly sound one. We need to be able to participate and social life of our community on a par with others and not having a, a mobile phone for example prevents you doing that and the more you know we have to assess whether innovations are actually um costed in terms of the costs of rendering things obsolete what are the costs of writing off things and we need a circular economy as well that will support that. 
Um, not answering this very well. Um, but so the concept of relative deprivation need, need not be at odds with the economics of enough. It, the idea is that the continual um, ratcheting up of the requirements for participating on a par with others is unequal. Um, the way that tends to continue to ratchet up as new forms of social organization arise and so on, that actually needs to be um, retarded and re rethought um, the many more in, in many ways of flourishing which don't involve many of these um, these kinds of observation these kinds of um, innovation simpler ways of life more sociable ways of life more convivial ways of life and um, rather than re regarding them as kind of romantic we need to evaluate them this is wealth in the broad broadest sense um can you repeat the last question the third question please um i, I couldn't scribble that fast enough yeah no no problem i'm just there's a lot of questions and praise and thanks coming in so i'm just through them all um the third question was about low growth in the uk and and the growing role of rentierism in tying up cash in, in increasing wealth extraction and its impact upon growth well, creating huge mountains of, of debt um, presupposes that the economy will be such that um, the rest of the economy, the so-called real economy, can afford to repay those, repay those debts. And so a low growth or post growth economy is going to cause a lot of um, problems for, for creditors. And unfortunately, a lot of pension funds invested in them. So yes, they have to be scaled back, um, or even you can tax the gains from it to individuals rather than changing the way necessarily changing the way the finance the finance operates. But uh, at the moment, I mean, in in Britain, only a minority of the financial services is actually funding productive investment. Most of it is against property. That's and that's absolutely absurd. It's methods for extracting wealth out of assets, and we could perhaps have an economy which required less work, not only because of AI and all that, but because we weren't having to support unproductive rentiers. But um, this is the sort of thing that um, colleagues in the New Economics Foundation and um, other think tanks on the left are trying to work out about how you actually transition to this. But I won't try to say more than that because I'm not sure I can. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people just really wanting to thank you for Bernie Grummel, for example, for a fascinating and thought provoking presentation. Um, people can't speak because of yowling cats, that's a quote, and other things going on in, in the background. Um, Maeve Hoolan has, she's not of the uh, Yowling Cat, has said, um, Andrew, it's great to hear you again. And at my home place, UCD, having attended your seminars as a PhD at Lancaster, and had the privilege of working on chapters with you and edited collections at Sharon Bolton. So I wanted to send warm regard and thank you for all the thinking you do, which helps us so much. Um, Sandra Nolan is yeah. a first year PhD candidate exploring equality, diversity, inclusion. And she says she really enjoyed this. She's a quick question. Uh, she'd like to know your views on the growing awareness around diversity, inclusion and inclusion in the business sector. Is it just a tick box exercise? Do you think it has any potential to create positive change? Um, Nick Stevenson, I'm sorry, I'm going so quickly, but you can choose what you, you can answer, uh, Andrew, and no pressure. Nick Stevenson was wondering about the political possibilities of the emergence of a project around that outlined in the talk. Most likely, he says, this would attract social democratic parties, but as we know, such parties are struggling for power. Not surprisingly, this after the failure of populism have, has left them moving into center ground. This would perhaps make the questioning of economic growth a difficult achievement. However, perhaps a better approach might be to look at ideas of the common good. This language seems to get lost in the neoliberal turn. Very good talk. Um, and Showcat 
Ali has asked, just so that I can better un understand the idea, is there some or any part of our economic lives to which moral economy as an approach to understanding our economic lives would not be suitable? In other words, is there a part of our economic lives that is not moral in the sense that it would need to be for moral economy to be a suitable approach for understanding it? So I'm afraid there's still more questions and thanks coming in, but I'm going to have to leave it, leave it at reading out those and just hand over to you, Andrew, in case you have okay, well, response I, to I, I, any I, of them. Okay, first of all, Sandra, I think it was. And thank you, Sandra. Um, diversity and inclusion in the business sector. Um, it should be quite feasible um, were it not for the fact of our class. I mean, one of the reasons why neoliberalism can seem progressive about things like sexuality and gender and sometimes race as, as well, um, is that making those things, those, those relationships more equal does not really threaten capitalism. Whereas equalizing class differences does. And organizations reproduce class every time they create jobs. They create them with particular skills, particular back bundles of tasks, which are either you know, interesting and rewarding or, or not. Different qualities, in other words, and with different rates of pay and different work conditions and security. And in so doing, just by creating a hierarchy of jobs and jobs of different quality, they are reproducing class. So then to say, well, that this is why it's not included in the usual list of equal, equal opportunities. So, you know, I would be relatively hopeful. You know, I think it's feasible about where, where in, as regards race and gender and, and sexuality and so on, and disability as well. Um, but class is a much harder nut to crack. You know, that's, that's, okay. And then Nick, um, about politics, there's an interesting debate, which I've only just very recently come across on the left about the language of politics, um, which in, in such a context as now, which has to be very different. It's not going to alienate people from the kind of language which I've used with that unearned income. It sounds really, <laughs> really bad. You know, oh dear, I'm a rentier, I'm a unearned income. All I'm trying to do is get a, is, uh, get a bit of money for my pension because I haven't got one, that kind of thing. You know. so, uh, how do you um, approach these issues in a more friendly way, if you like, which doesn't alienate people, but which gets them on side, as it were, and it has to offer them something positive, obviously. Um, phrases like the common good may be, good, may be useful. And uh, certainly in British politics, because we have this stupid first past the post system, it means you can have a government with a majority of 80, 80 um, with only 44% of the vote. I learned the other day that the only other European country which has first past the post is Belarus. Belarus. And uh, so it's very easy for a, a big party to keep in power as long as it divides the opposition. And you, you get it, if we, you know, if we had proportional representation, then we could have, yes, we'd have coalitions a lot of the time, but we could have a better quality of politics, not so, you know, naive, you know, primitively um, adversarial, depressing, you know, it could be actually constructive, working where there's overlap and so on. But um, I think PR is a, is a prerequisite. But I don't know where moral economy is not applicable. I have to think about that. <laughs> but if you've got any ideas, I'd be interested. Right. Thanks, Andrew. We did say we'd finish at 7.30. There's still um, thanks coming in. And for the uh, two respondents as well, Virgo Finnegan, wanted to thank you, Gideon, especially for... Um, your remarks about the dangers of scholasticism and the importance of everyday knowledge, which he says is especially valuable for critical social science. Jelen Mulkeen, John Baker, Dean Kern, and others 
all thanking you, Andrew, for your inspirational talk and uh, letting you know how much it has informed their work and continues to do so. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up there um, and uh, thank you all very much for such an enjoyable evening and such an enjoyable discussion, which has given us so much to think about. Andrew, yeah. Can I just say thank you so much, Marie, for organising this and Ballyhara and, oh. and everybody yeah. else. It's been brilliant. And uh, maybe one day we could actually meet in person. That would, that would not be nice. So It'll be really lovely. And in the meantime, the video will be posted on the Equality Studies webpage in the next few days. Um, sure. So you can all watch back there. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And good night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.